why don't we go ahead and, and transition to the movie now, and uh, we'll narrate this as we go along. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, time flies, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun all through the whole thing. Uh, first thing, of course, prior to getting ready to go is uh, getting ready for the orange suits. All of us getting uh, pretty up, doctored up. We didn't all need our hair braided, but uh, here's Claude getting an initial uh, TSS uh, familiarization. We uh, enjoyed uh, going out to the vehicle uh, in daylight. This was my first uh, experience with that, and uh, it was kind of nice to be able to see what was going on for the first time. I've seen a couple of space shuttle launches uh, from different viewing areas, and it was always very spectacular. Being on the inside even was quite a bit more spectacular. Launch countdown was about as perfect as it can get. And I apologize, but we're 48 seconds late. And uh, I was just, I was hoping that we could do it in 46 seconds, but it missed by a couple seconds. The, uh, the thought that really crossed my mind more than anything else going through all of this was, was what it took to make all of this happen. It's hard to, to think about and imagine the thousands of people or the tens of thousands of people that can make all of this work. And to take such a complex piece of machinery and make it look so simple and look so easy. It's very graceful and very easy as it goes up on his ascent. There's some uh, shock waves that are coming as we're going through Mach 1, which is about uh, 40,000 feet or so. Well, this was the first of 126 space sunrises that we saw. Uh, just uh, soon after we got onto orbit, we opened the payload bay doors. And the complement of payloads that we carried, you can see the tethered satellite up towards the front of the cargo bay, behind it the Eureka, which we soon deployed, and then the uh, EOIM payload. So first order of business was to get the arm out and uh, pick up Eureka. This is the grapple of Eureka and the cargo bay. Uh, I'm approaching Eureka with the arm, and this was a view from the end effector camera. And, uh, this is a position I had for uh, operating the uh, remote manipulator system. At this point, I'm very close to Eureka, and I'm going to grapple it, press the trigger to grapple it, while uh, Andy was uh, maneuvering the orbiter and uh, Franco was taking pictures. It was a blue shift activity at this time. Now, I'm uh, unberthing Eureka from the cargo bay. This black structure that you see in front of Eureka are the folded uh, solar rays. Uh, this whole operation took about six hours while we're lifting Eureka out of the bay and also performing various maneuvers, that are, as I mentioned before, to calibrate uh, sensors. Now you see the folded solar array on one side of Eureka pretty clearly. And it, it's about at that point uh, that we started having problems with payload communication. Uh, but when we were flying over some sites like Kourou, French Guiana, the ground couldn't command, for instance, solar array deployment, you, which you see on this picture here. And in a few seconds, you'll see the tensioning process uh, at the end of the solar array deployment. You see the solar array that uh, take a stiff shape and uh, wave somewhat, uh, indicating a proper stiffening and tensioning of the cables uh, that were used to deploy the solar arrays. A uh, spectacular view of a, a pass over the Red Sea and uh, the Middle East uh, with Eureka at the tip of the arm shortly before release of Eureka. And here we go, after release. This is coming back over the Kennedy Space Center again. We just really like this picture. The, uh, the separation burn uh, went real fine. We moved out to 1,000 feet, and we actually kept it to work orbital mechanics and to save a little bit of propellant. We actually worked from about 920 feet out to about uh, 1,150 feet. And this is basically what Eureka looked like at 1,000 feet away from us. And then we did the OTM burn, which is about five hours later, which put it in its proper attitude. Uh, Jeff went ahead and took that picture for us. A beautiful picture of the moon going by Eureka. Here we are setting up the Science Operations Center down in the mid deck. Uh, we have this uh, personal computer, the up to date technology is coming into the Space Shuttle 2. And now we're uh, raising the boom, getting ready to deploy the tethered satellite. So far, everything with TSS has gone perfectly. The boom rose. Um, when we got up to the top, we had the first difficulty, we attempted to extract uh, one of this, this little umbilical at the top. It didn't pull out, so we rotated back and forth a little bit. We, uh, we put it in a position where we could expose it to the sun, heat it up. Here's a, a nice close-up view of it. 
Um, finally, uh, in, in uh, attempting to keep it exposed to the sun, we ended up with a site that we never thought we'd see. The uh, TSS boom and the satellite pointed down towards the Earth. Someday on a future mission, we may actually lower a tether satellite down into the upper reaches of the atmosphere. And that'll also be very exciting. But in any case, uh, finally, uh, Lauren uh, moved the whole orbiter away, and you can see the umbilical pulling. Uh, we did then, we were ready for flyaway. We had an, the first attempt uh, didn't work, but finally uh, we got the thing going, and here it is. And this is that portion then that, uh, where the orbiter is in free drift, and the satellite, as you can see here, is moving uh, very slowly away from the boom tip. Uh, but notice also, of course, that it is very stable. There's no tendency for the satellite to uh, uh, roll off or do any pitching moments. And uh, the, the tether was very stable also. Each of us had an assigned task that we were uh, doing uh, all through the early deploy phases. And uh, that always entailed somebody checking uh, CRT displays up front and looking out the windows to uh, make sure that the satellite and the tether system were uh, in, a, in a safe configuration. Uh, we continued to fly it away. Uh, you're about 15 or 20 meters here. Notice that the tether is still very straight and very stable in this configuration. It wasn't until we got much longer lengths that we started to notice any significant tether oscillations. At about a 25 meter length, then, we deactivated the KU band uh, system for communications and converted it into a radar and started tracking the satellite so we could tell uh, an additional means of where it was. Now the tether is getting long enough that we started to see uh, a lot of vibrations. This, this may look like a very loose tether, but, but there was normal tension in this tether. This is just the way a tether behaves. Uh, this is the system after we hit the first snag. Um, it, it already has pretty much reached stability, and we were getting ready now to run the tether out for this so-called running start. Um, it, it, and here it goes. You can see we were spewing tether out of, uh, we have probably about 20 or 30 meters of slack tether. You can see how it, it takes up the coiled shape that it was on the uh, reel. But before long, uh, the satellite uh, keeps moving away. It, it pulls out the slack tether. And uh, it's basically uh, until we... Uh, reached the next snag, it continued to move away, and even after the next snag, it basically uh, went into a stable configuration. I guess uh, the next part was uh, the red shift had been up uh, for, for a pretty long day here, and uh, we needed to get them put to bed, so we put them to bed, and uh, for the blue shift, it was pretty much uh, watching the, the satellite that night. Normally, we were going to be watching about 20 uh, kilometers and doing our normal station keeping. This is a site out the uh, COAS, which is an optical alignment site, which is one of the ways that I could uh, judge how the satellite was maneuvering for us. It was actually extremely well behaved, and over an eight-hour period, I never even fired a jet. During the, all the on-station phase, of course, all the science instrumentations were working, and uh, we were also watching with the top instrumentation, the satellite, which here shines against the uh, image intensifier uh, picture of the sky. We weren't able, as I said, to continue the deployment. This is how you retrieve a satellite. You have to move the shuttle underneath in order to get the tether to come back uh, in the proper place, and that's what we're about to do. All of our operations were really conducted in a manual mode, and I think that's important to note because uh, this system was supposed to have been automatic, and it points out the value of the human being in the loop. Uh, the satellite was being controlled by, uh, by jet firings uh, from uh, keyboards, and the tether was being controlled also from the keyboard, and everything was very smooth. Uh, the inlines were turned, in, uh, turned on a, a little bit uh, later than expected, but uh, the docking was very, very smooth. After docking the satellite on the docking ring, we commanded the retraction of the boom, which you see here. Uh, and there was still some uh, alignment of the satellite to perform prior to latching the satellite in Cargo Bay. And there was, of course, a big relief in the crew uh, at that time. What you see now is the Ohms burn that lowered us from the 160-mile altitude down to the 128-mile altitude. And now, while we had our EOIM experiment in the bay looking at atomic oxygen, we proceeded with some different medical experiments in a little bit more relaxed time for the crew. 
um, while Jeff is doing his medical experiments, uh, those of us that could now get to a window, that have not been able to see a window, were upstairs uh, taking pictures. You also see in my hand there the controller that ran the IMAX camera we had in the payload bay. Now we had the opportunity to see the Earth out of the uh, windows, whereas before we'd been looking pretty much at space, and, and we took advantage every time we could. We noticed one thing at 128 miles that the Earth appears to move much more quickly past you than it does at any higher altitude, and we had the opportunity to look at 230 and 160 miles, and the Earth just smoked right by. This is uh, Java. You can see the line of, of volcanoes that look like they've been laid out with a straight edge. You can also see how blue the planet looks. I mean, I, it always amazed me how very blue things looked. One of the uh, things that most interests uh, us uh, these days is the burning of the Amazon forest. And this, what you see there are little plumes of uh, uh, ground fires in the area of uh, central Brazil. And then, uh, of course, uh, we, we got uh, to be able to zoom in with a very powerful lens. And you can see some of the patches of deforestation in the uh, state of Rondonia in Brazil. It's an, it's an area that we've been watching over and over uh, as missions uh, go by. And uh, we see all the, the patterns of deforestation in, in long geometrical uh, lines as uh, roads and uh, population expands uh, in, into that area. We uh, also tried to uh, photograph uh, the entire uh, Caribbean uh, basin and, uh, of course, Brazil and Central America. We managed to, uh, to get pictures of all of the Central American uh, capitals, but uh, we're not able to get uh, Costa Rica because it was always cloudy over there. I guess this is a part of the... Uh, Persian. Persian that is the Persian Gulf. Yes, I'm always sleeping. And uh, a big... Uh, Big storm. Is that Javier? Javier. Javier. Is somebody else? Uh, this is Baja California, and uh, we come on down through uh, Central America and southern and um, southern Mexico, and we're able to zoom in into the city of uh, Acapulco. I think uh, you can appreciate uh, the power of that lens. It's hard to it's hard to keep the camera. Uh, steady when you're zooming in that close, and so you have to wedge yourself uh, uh, against the window. As I said, uh, most of the uh, area was uh, cloudy, but uh, we were able to get a few good shots. It's a feel for what it would take to do a simple task in orbit, like changing the batteries in your camera. Um, it was sometimes more than a tube, and we've been using the cameras a lot, so the batteries are pretty hot. But keep it, I mean, think about this. Try to change batteries one day without ever dropping apart. And here we are playing our volleyball Olympic Games, uh, Switzerland against Italy. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a good way of keeping in shape in space and, of course, learning about dynamics in space. This is uh, something that we ran as a, a way of explaining in a, in a future audiovisual to uh, youngsters how tethers works in space. This is the principle of uh, angular momentum conservation. And as you see, when we elongate the tether, we have a slower rotational speed. And of course, the principal investigator of this uh, research at the end of the experiment has the right to take advantage of the, of the apples. <laughs> Physics works. <laughs> While some of us uh, still thought it was necessary to do a little bit of work during these final couple of days, you can see uh, we did have an ergometer on board that was one of our medical DSOs, but Jeff uh, still found, found time to uh, play with his all-metal uh, yo-yo there and uh, demonstrate yet more uh, principles of physics with that. The uh, PHCF, the growth hormone experiment, was their one mid-deck experiment. It required that you take it out and rotate it five times in ten seconds every day. So instead of rotating the box, I'm holding the box, and Franklin's rotating me. Well, eventually it gets time that we got to come home. And uh, this is just Lauren and I on the flight deck doing the uh, flight control checkout. You can see some of the elevons moving there in the picture there as we check out all the flight control services. And then we put the red team to bed and make sure we're all set to go for deorbit the next morning. When we launched, it was just about a new moon. We were up for eight days, one day more than we had planned, and this is what the moon looked like when we finished. Uh, 126 times we got to see the moon rise and then the sunset over the payload bay, and it was just as beautiful every time we saw it. But it was finally time to come home.
By the time we were ready to come home, we knew that uh, we were coming home either to KSC or to Edwards, so it was a simple matter of uh, putting on the suits and, and getting ready to do the entry. We just didn't know where we were going to burn to for a while. But KSC cleared out. The weather, as you can see here, is uh, only scattered clouds, the very smooth air, a lot of moisture. We didn't see the condensation trails that you folks did on the ground, but uh, it was a pleasure to fly the entry and the uh, final approach through that nice smooth air for a change. Uh, as we come in, uh, start to pull up about 1,800 feet and pass through 300 feet, Andy got the gear down, uh, another major task I assigned him a long time ago, and, and he did a marvelous job of that. Uh, probably much better than my subsequent landing, but uh, it, it looks okay, and it uh, really did look good from the inside as well. So uh, uh, we touched down there uh, about 1,900 feet down the runway, roughly, and then rolled uh, to a stop on uh, runway 33 at KSC. Uh, this is really some kind of an experience here after eight days in space, and uh, uh, I remember uh, sitting there doing switch throws and everything. That wasn't too bad, but that initial attempt to stand up was something else. Eventually, we all found our legs, though, and uh, uh, stumbled out of the spacecraft and uh, had a look around. <laughs> 